Church in New York City. Dr. King is speaking on Vietnam because he has decided to break the silence and protest against American involvement in Vietnam. In fact, Dr. King said that we are on the wrong side of the revolution. Dr. King is speaking to the clergy and in the layman. A layman is a non-ordained member of the church. Remember that in 1967, the U.S. was turned upside down. America was at a different point at this time. The panelists will give an overview of what King is thinking and as to why we should remove ourselves from Vietnam and how we can get on the right side of the revolution. I'll be talking about Dr. King's seven main reasons for speaking out and breaking the silence on the war in Vietnam. The, his first reason was that the war in Vietnam was taking the focus off of helping the impoverished people of America. He said, I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energy into rehabilitation of the poor so long as, the so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money. He viewed the war in Vietnam as an enemy and believed that it should be attacked as such. His second reason was that young black men were being sent to fight in a war on behalf of a country that um, they weren't equal in. He said, we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So why send these, black, these young black men to advocate for democracy and freedom, which they do not have at home? His third reason was being, of course, he didn't believe in violence. And... Um, when he would protest violence up north, in the ghettos up north, um, the young men would ask him, you know, what about the war in Vietnam? He said, I knew that I could never raise my voice against violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. His fourth reason was to save America's soul said, we cannot limit civil rights to black people in America. It must be an international movement supporting people regardless of race, religious preference, gender, and sexuality. Fifth, he believed that one day America will be what it is supposed to be. By this, I believe he means, he meant when his American dream comes true, America will then be what it's supposed to be, more like home. Um, Another reason of his was the fact that he won the Nobel Peace Prize, and he felt um, that that like that he should work harder for um, the brotherhood of man. Therefore, he felt compelled to speak out and break the silence um, regarding the war in Vietnam. His seventh reason was ministry. Dr. King followed in the footsteps of Christ. He felt that the relationship of ministry and making peace were so interconnected that he must break the silence and speak out against the war. Out of these seven reasons, which do you believe was the most significant reason for Dr. King to speak publicly opposing the war? Um, the next section um, to focus on with this speech is Strange Liberators. And King basically looked at America as strange liberators to the Vietnamese people. Because at the time, um, the Vietnamese were fighting for self-determination and a government that was run by them for them. 
and they had already fought the, J the Japanese and the French. So when they asked America, they asked America to help them um, establish their own government. Instead of America helping them establish their own government, America assisted the French in defeating them and putting them back in a colonial, um, a colonial state. So as far as a liberator, that's why King um, considered the government as a strange liberator to the Vietnamese people. In addition, um, I want you to keep in mind that Dr. King's views began changing in 1967. And this was one of the main reasons um, behind his assassination um, exactly a year after this speech. <clears throat> the next section I will focus on is um, protesting the war. And with protesting the war, King began to hold himself and his colleagues accountable for their actions and their leadership role in the black community. Um, like Jordan has stated earlier that King called on the ministers and um, he had to address the young, the young males that were up north fighting and rioting because he was calling for a nonviolence protest. Um, in King holding himself and his colleagues accountable, he encouraged conscientious objection of the war among young men and all ministers because he was against, um, as Jordan stated earlier also, that he was against um, black males fighting in this war when they didn't have the same um, opportunities at home as a free man. Um, he asked for the people to decide on the protest that best suited their struggle. And he emphasized that everyone must protest. It didn't matter what you did, um, but as long as you did something to show that you were against the Vietnam War. The war in Vietnam, he, he described as a symptom of deep disease in the American spirit and stated that it, there needed to be a significant change in American life and policy. Um, a, in 1957, a sensitive American official overseas noted that our nation was on the wrong side of a world revolution. Instead of fighting for the oppressed Vietnamese, we were assisting the French in defeating the efforts, like I said earlier. This position America has taken, whether by choice or by accident, brought up JFK's um, words in 1962, which was, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. In my opinion, this is very important um, because America refused to give up the privileges and pleasures that came with profits over in overseas investments. They were um, funding the war for the French to fight, and 80% of that cost for the French was sponsored by our government. Um, King looked at this as um, ultimately bad individual capitalists. So when reading that, it makes you think that, that they are good and bad capitalists. And that he, um, with a good capitalist, he called for a radical revolution of values so that we can focus on a person-oriented society instead of a materialistic society. He stated that the true revolution calls us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. True compassion follows true action, not just flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes from the edifice which produces the beggar's needs restructuring. And basically he's saying that um, instead of helping someone out, restructure that whole system where everyone is equal and everybody is no need to help anyone out everyone is taken care of. Um, instead of looking at the problem, there needs to be examination of the cause. The America was capitalizing off of different countries' land for profit without regard to the social betterment, and he stated that this was not just. Nor was it just the Western arrogance that we were better than everyone and we couldn't learn from them. And as war as a means to settle differences, all these things he looked at as America's um, spirit being corrupt.
or bad. Um, because he later stated that America is spiritually dead. And with reading this, I try to compare it to today's society um, because some of the cures weren't um, administered during the Vietnam War. And King's words are still alive and well today. And this discussion can be related to our lives. Um, even though it was 50 years ago, and with the theme going with remembering the civil rights movement after 50 years, it's still things that can be done in America by everyone to protest something that they disagree with that's going on um, in society. Um, to conclude this, King began to look up upon himself because if you want to change anything in the world, you have to first change yourself before you can change anything else. Um, if there is something that you don't support or don't agree with, you don't have to go with mainstream and you couldn't support, you do have a voice. And um, we have to understand and respect values and morals over profit and money. And I think that's the basic, um, the basic message behind this is that America really needed a check on their moralities and their values. So um, I would leave by asking, um, what would you protest or what would you see fit to protest today compared to what King was doing? Okay, so we're going to open up to the uh, question. So I'm going to let Brittany propose her question again. Um, as you African-American youth, what do you think... Um, you could protest for in today's society, I guess. <laughs> Is there anything that you find um, that could be changed, whether on campus or in life or in the African-American community in general? Yes. No, we got one. <laughs> Um, I would say more education for our youth because um, back then in the 1980s or 90s, um, our yeah, our education we didn't have that much, I guess, and now and now right now in this, in this century, um, I would like more education so I can further. My um my education my educational goals and personal goals and career goals, I guess. Yeah. I would say um, following his question, oh, she's on response. I would say equal opportunity for blacks and other races in elementary school, middle school education system, like um programs, and stuff like that. As African Americans, I think there is a lot we can protest against that, because there's a lot hey, that goes Excuse me, excuse me a second. And the other, the, identify yourself. Let everybody know who you are and, uh, you know, oh. identify yourself. Okay. My name is Tyron Fleming. I am Mr. Junior at the Early Middle College of Hamilton. So, um, my question, well, what I, what I want to say is there's many things we can protest against, but one thing I want to say is that as African Americans, we have a bunch of opportunities. And as African Americans, I think we should get together and talk about those opportunities so other people know about these opportunities and so they can be successful in their lives also. So, that's what I want to say. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nana Poku. I go here. Well, Nancy, I'm a junior. And I would say that we could protest the tuition surcharges and increases, and we could try to find ways 
for speaking to the truth. I feel like we should protest like with what was previously stated with the Trayvon Martin and oh I'm Monica. <laughs> I go to Anti. And um with the Trayvon Martin and Jordan cases, um that that law in Florida is just not right. And if it was reversed, they would have a big problem with it. That needs to change. That's all. Um, my name is Mario Day. I'm a journalism mass communication major at AMT. Um, I would have to say, not only African Americans, but minorities, period. Uh, piggybacking off what uh, this young man said with education. Uh, I know in public schools hold, hold, holds a lot of minorities within, within them. And I um, honestly feel that in public schools, there are not a lot of textbooks and uh, the education is pretty much bad to me. And I feel like we should protest against that because this whole standardized testing deal is, to me, flawed. I think it's trying to keep minorities within a box and not trying to help us think out of the box. And it's just, it's a big problem. And I feel like we should protest against that and try to get a better education. at the at Harrison Middle School and what's in play right now is no child left behind and so kind of going off what he said I would like to protest against that because what it is is a child cannot turn in anything at all and it's a zero in the grade book but at the end of the year the teacher has to put a 60 in that place and so they just pass them along pass them along pass them along and then they get to high school and they don't fall for that and then most of the children drop out. And the dropout rate is in the African American community. So I would like to protest against that. Um, it was put into place by George Bush. And I really just feel like he said it's keeping us in a predicament where the students don't come from good households, so they come to school and they act out what they see at home and then their grades aren't good, and then by the time they get to high school, they're not ready. Hi, I'm Brittany. I'm a pre-law major. Oh, let me stand up. <laughs> I'm a pre-law major here at ANT. Um, I don't think I would protest anything, but I do think that I would advocate for us to educate ourselves, not only uh, when it comes to school, but for us to know the things that are going on around us. We oftentimes complain about what's happening and the laws that are being passed, but we are the people who can change that. We educate ourselves and know who we're voting and know what they're standing for and know what they want to do. They are going to directly vote on those things that either are going to change our lives in a positive or negative way. So I guess I just want to say everyone vote. Even in primaries, um, know who you're voting for, know what's going on. A lot of people don't know about the Koch brothers. You know, these are people who are really influencing things that are going on with us. So I think that um, knowing what's going on and knowing correct information is very important. Hi, my name is Terry Hightower. I am a freshman mechanical engineering student at a &T. And I believe we should change our mindset on black culture because black culture has always been shaped like in a negative light. Anything that an African American would do is just completely negative. Like if we go to school, somebody outside of race might get mad at us just because we're trying to better ourselves. So I believe it's more like a mindset change and more looking at African Americans in a positive light because we can actually do good and we can actually better ourselves without somebody trying to put it down all the time. Uh, 
Hey, I'm uh, Johnny Burnett, and uh, I'm a junior here at uh, ANT, and uh, I think I would protest uh, our community coming together more. Uh, I don't think um, protesting the government to fix the education is really going to be the solution. I think we should all just educate ourselves. Like the young lady up in front said, that we should really educate ourselves and uh, become more aware of what's going on out there. And really just, uh, like a study came out, I think two days ago they said uh, uh, that white Americans and Asian Americans are the most ready for college. And I think uh, Asian Americans, uh, they focused on, like their whole family focused on <laughs> educating the children in their homes. And I think our families should be more into stuff like that. So, that's up. Um, I'm Nandi Smith, a political science major here in AT. And just to go off of what he said, I was thinking pretty much the same. We need to push to lessen the amount of black and black crime and in doing so I feel as though it would lead to our community having more respect for one another and also will allow all minorities overall to have greater num numbers when protesting the inequality in our society to push for change and much needed revolution for just for making change instead of just sitting and complaining about wanting change is actually going out there and starting this revolution that we need. Anybody else that would like to speak on the question posed? Is there anybody that would like to pose a question to them? Hello everybody, uh, my name is Yannick Gomez, uh, I'm an aerospace engineer at a and and I had a question, so you were uh, saying that um, you wanted a difference between good and bad capitalism, but is there really a difference? Because, um, I mean, at the end of the day, they all want profit, so there's really not a big difference between um, Good or bad, or um, caring for people, because you can you can make it seem like you care about people, but at the end of the day, you still care about your profit. So, what is uh, the big difference? Yeah, I think at this um, time, King was still figuring out his um, his views, and it may have been coming out when he was saying the speech. Um, I think ultimately there is no good and bad capitalists because that is their main goal is to get profit. So I think that um, he just really wanted, um, if, if you were going to have, I know it's weird, but it's like if you're going to have capitalism, just have it with, um, just have morals behind it. Don't let it just fully be about money. But then if it's, if we would have seen what he really would have um, thought after this about the um dividing them, I think that he would have seen that both of them were the same and probably would have tried to call for something new. Hi, very good. Uh, and what you have been uh, talking about very much relates to our uh, keynote speaker uh, last night uh, about the March on Washington, which really began uh, earlier uh, as uh, improvements and for jobs for everyone, and particularly the African-American community. And then someone posed uh, what happened after, or uh, towards the end of civil rights movement, as a backlash. And we can feel that today in terms of uh, black and brown incarceration of males, uh, the voting rights changes, and ID, and gerrymandering, and the Koch brothers. And I agree, you do begin with yourself, with education, improving yourself and your community. But ultimately, you do have to get out and, and protest on moral Mondays. Uh, and, and only by uh, really making your voice, by maybe any means necessary, uh, can you change some of the things, because these people have big money. And we live in a global society. Uh, uh, the speaker last night said that even when Martin Luther King was alive, people, the job thing was tight, and it's even tighter. And so it's not just even in America, but globally, 
ordinary workers, ordinary people, even in China and Indonesia, they're not getting fair wages. They're not living uh, a right on working in good conditions. So people have to look at the bad of good capitalism, which is, is the same, and try to, to fight for workers and, and for fairness within our own community in this country, but also worldwide. for you guys. Do you believe that uh, Dr. King kind of predicted that 1% with, when he was talking about like the good versus bad capitalism? Do you think that he predicted it? Yeah, the, 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 that's ultimately what would happen. That there would be a 1% that's, you know, deciding everything and they're making all the money and then think, everybody um, else is. I think that it was a 1% during this time also and that's what made him say something about it, you know? Because, I mean, um, even though we look at it as 50 years ago, I think that it's still um, the same it's the same model is still in structure. And he might was just bringing light to the majority of people to letting them know that this is what's going on. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, with listening to everyone's response um, about protesting, I don't think that when they um saying protest in the war, it means to necessarily go out and like start marching or something. But um, just as individuals, I think that we can do stuff on smaller levels, like um, was talking about the education and the community, I think that the black community as youth and young adults, that we need to, instead of being so focused on I as an individual, we need to focus, since we are able to get education and we have made it to this part um, in our educational journey, I think that at this point in time that we should start going to like elementary and middle schools or YMCAs and starting to try to mentor like younger um, kids because as we as we know and as some people have stated that the family structures the house is sometimes out of order and you can see that in the child's behavior at school and so I think that with being a and if we do help these children I think that we need to look at it as and be serious about it because they need somebody that's going to stay in their lives and help them because so many people are walking in and out. Um, I also think that we must um, be more prideful and even the things that are shown on TV that contribute, I mean, that kind of portray the African American culture is sometimes negative, like these shows that's on VH1, they have grown women fighting each other and um, just we, we don't have to entertain that. And if they see less entertaining, enter, um, us entertaining that, then I think that less ratings will get the sh um, shows off of TV. Um, money, I think we need some money too. <laughs> but I mean, because that, that solves the problems. But um, just um, by supporting, I mean, I think that we can support businesses, small businesses that help the community in turn and with doing these small little things, I think that it could be bring about bigger changes and bigger opportunities for us to advance and not look to the government to just give us anything, but as a black community to hold our own and represent and take care of our own community also. Um, as far as Dr. King's seven reasons for breaking the silence on the war, um, are there any of those things that you think are still, you know, in effect today as far as, you know, the government doing things to take focus off of the poor um, or just the inequality between whites and blacks? Um, and, you know, like, how does that, do you think those things are still in effect today or have we overcome those things? 
Any responses? Black people use the race card too much. And I feel like um, every time, like, black people don't do certain things because they feel like I'm not going to get as good because I'm not white or this happened because I'm black. I feel like we use the race card a little bit too much sometimes. I'm not saying racism does not still exist, but sometimes we have to step out of that and stop always using it oh, it's because I'm black. That's that's right. And we have a black president, so it's like times are kind of trying to change. So, yeah, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a junior. Um, I actually had a presentation in my speech class um, the class before this about racial profiling. And, um, like you said, like the inequality between black and white. And our main point was that. Racial profiling is still a big issue, but it has progressed. Like, it has gotten better since the times of the 1950s and I'm around these times. Um, but it is still a big issue. But as she said, we made it a point of it's not just between you can't expect all um, white people to just be like, okay, we can't just say, oh, white people, you have to change, or you can't be treating us the same. We have to do it within our own, like, race. We have to um, teach our children and then teach them to teach their children that it comes from yourself. You have to give them a model to respect and to treat the same way that they treat themselves. And you can't just, like she said, you can't just expect them to um, not play that race card. You have to um, bring yourself up to their standards so that, you know, you're looked at as respectful instead of just as a typical African American. My name is Lim Patterson, and I'm one of your non-traditional students here at AMT. <laughs> and I want to touch on something that's not going to be popular with y'all. You talk about your pride and your education, all this kind of stuff. And I've been back two years. And I'm just wondering, what would Dr. King say about the use of cell phones in classes? <laughs> I, find, I find that one of the most distracting things since I've been back at AMT. I just see a lot of time wasted in classes. I mean, that's just a problem for me. I mean, do you ever think about it? I mean, if Dr. King was up there giving us a talk and you all out here on your cell phones not paying attention, I mean, what would he say? I mean, I just throw out a whole lot of time to get wasted in classes with these cell phones. <laughs> But I don't take it out in front, like in class, while, say, if I'm in Dr. Zendegi's class, I don't take it out in class. And I don't know if y'all watch the Boondocks, y'all watch the Boondocks in here? Okay, why, the reason why I like the Boondocks is, it's funny, but it has a moral uh, to the story. Uh, do y'all remember the episode when Martin Luther King came back to life and uh, he was trying to give a speech and everybody was just partying, dancing, not listening to what he had to say? Um, it's just basically showing that as African Americans, we need to do better, we need to pay attention. Yes, like you said, we talked about like our education and all this stuff, but what are we doing to even get that education? Like, we're not even paying attention. I know in uh, my English class, it's a, it's a couple of students that are rude to my English teacher when she's trying to give out the information that they need to go over stuff that they need. And they talk back to her, they laugh, and they don't, they don't respect her as a person. And I feel like that's, that's terrible. And we need to do better, for one. And um, also to go off what she said, uh, black people or African Americans constantly play the race card. Um, I believe that's true to a certain extent. Um, with the uh, Trayvon Martin case and I think the, the Dunn case in Florida, 
um, I seen on Facebook and all the social media that black African Americans, especially the younger generation, want to suddenly become activists. And it's funny to me because like if it was the other way around, if like a, a Caucasian person was killed and it, it was like unruly, unjustified, you all wouldn't be protesting against that or you wouldn't be on Facebook saying, oh, that's wrong. Or if it was black on black crime, no one would speak on that, you know? And I feel like it's not right. And we need, we need to change our perspectives and our mindsets. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to address um, what the um, older man and the younger man said, <laughs> um, I think that um, with Ki how King felt about it, I mean, he addressed it even though technology wasn't as big as it is now then. He addressed um, us moving away from a thing-oriented society as far as materialistic and um, being just being focused and driven by everything that's not human. That's, you know, like even around the campus, you can see people walking around, but they will sometimes bump into you because nobody's looking up. They're looking down at their phones. So I definitely agree with technology and these cell phones being a major problem. Also, I think that it goes with respect that if you, if you respect your professor and you respect your education, and if you didn't just, maybe if you didn't, um, get loans because you can't really see that money so you're not really thinking that oh um i'm paying for my education you kind of hold a notion that you're getting free education if we respect our professors and respect our education and this comes with having morals and values within yourself then these things could change um and that's his whole that was his whole point in calling to america to um take a radical revolution of values because he's seen then that our values were, go were, not, were not things that could progress us. It was things that was holding us back and was causing us to be poisoned by the system of capitalism. Um, I had something else to say. Did I write it? Um, but you were talking, um, you had stated that with the Dun about the Dunn case and the Trayvon Martin case. I think that black, um, we as African Americans have been having um, a lot of injustice done to us. So you kind of, I think that a lot of people, even with the Trayvon Martin case and the Dunn case, even though it was out, it was evidence that was clear that these, pe these two um, African American boys were killed wrongfully, that it should have been a just, um, outcome, and I think in an in a African American community, we felt as though he was going to get off, and even having that feeling as a community, I think that we could have been behind one another better, and instead of protesting, physically marching, or trying to get the government to do something that we as individuals need to change. We have black lawyers, we have black um, chief, um, justice, we have um, black legislators. So those are the people that we can um, kind of address or try to bring into the community or even, you know, look at those positions and see where you want to fill those positions and what would you do in that position to make the um, right changes. Because I think that we can't keep blaming the government on these things, that we have to hold accountability for ourselves. And that's another thing that King was um, looking to his fellow ministers and even the young men to hold yourself accountable. What position would you play? And don't just think that just because you're, you're one individual that you cannot get change done. Like you can, um, what did he say? Um, he encouraged everyone to protest something or in any type of way. And I think that, um, that it's, like I said, it's still alive and well today and we can use this and read his other speeches because he has so, I mean, he has a lot of speeches. And it's not just the I have a dream speech that they outplay every year that we get tired of sometimes. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of things that we don't know. We look at King, but we really don't know King. 
And I think that we need to really get to know King and get to know those people that stood up and fought. Because even though it seemed like it's harder now, I think that they have paved the way and they have given us what to do was right and what to do was wrong to go ahead and pave the way for us and future generations to be able to stop having this conversation of racism or of injustice and inequality in America. My name is Michael Roberto. I'm uh, an associate professor in the Department of History, and I just want to, before we all leave, I just want to say that uh, this panel discussion today is uh, a very, uh, is a great uh, product of what we can do here at this university. Uh, these three young women who are my students in History 435 and who read King's speech and who spent a great deal of time uh, dissecting the speech and presenting it today and then getting comments from many of you, including uh, some of my students in History 130, like Mr. Gomez and, and Ms. Uh, Ms. Smith, who asked very, very fine questions. Uh, and they're not history majors either. I think they're both engineering students. You're political science, uh, Mr. Gomez is engineering. So, I mean, I just want to say thank you and well done. Yes. Very, very well done. This is this has just been uh, uh, this has been worth uh, helping to do and being here uh, and watching you do it. And I just want to quickly say I heard the comment earlier about the standing ground laws in Florida. I just want to stress the point. North Carolina has some of the same laws too, so there's something to be concerned about. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Are there any more questions? Oh. Hi, I'm Dewana Wall, and I am an assistant professor in history. And Brittany, you raised a really good point about Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech that gets trotted out every January. Uh, for his birthday. And so my question is for um, both you and Jordan. Why do you think there's such pressure to remember just that speech as opposed to this Riverside Church speech? Why do we remember the, the positive, integrated version of Martin Luther King as opposed to this more um, radical activist I side? I believe that. I believe because, um, you know, people didn't want to focus on the negative of what was going on within our own country. So they didn't want to mention all these things that were in this speech, you know. I think that you said it yourself because he's a radical activist and King was, um, his platform was more of a safe activist. He said things that were, you know, unheard of, but it was okay. So I think that's why it, uh, this speech isn't recognized because it's radical. It goes against the grain. I also think that um, the I Have a Dream speech, it promotes and um, focuses on race. And since that is still kind of a problem, it's like um, to him, to, to listen to the speech and today, and, and for an individual today, I feel like that it in seeing what's portrayed in the world, I mean, if we have made made it to where he says um, with little black boys and little black girls can go to schools and everything with whites. We've made it that far, so I feel like they play that speech to, to kind of get in your head that we've made it so we don't really have any other thing to fight about or to talk about. Like, he, this was his dream um, 50 years ago, so it has come true 50 years later. But I also think that in order for us to um, understand and, and truly know King that we need to address, I mean, look at and kind of dissect all of his speeches to see his train of thought because the I Have a Dream speech was made um, a couple years before this um, Beyond Vietnam speech. So that's what, um, that's my opinion on that.
questions? So um, Jordan has identified the seven main points as to why the war should end. And Brittany also covered two points um, and talked about why King, why we must understand the Vietnamese and what it means to be nonviolent, and even looking at our own government. King is opposed to capitalism and nonviolence and, and how it perpetrates, um, sorry, and it's how it perpetrates society. And he also has socialist values. And what's ironic about this is that um, Christianity, Christianity values um, socialism, but is anti-communist. And also, Brittany explained how King offers to protest against the war, and King calls for America to undergo a radical revolution of values. So thank you for attending this panel.